So, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage with a big round of applause, Professor Amnon Chashua. <laughs> Good morning. I thought to touch upon you know, three areas of, uh, of AI involved in processing sound, processing sight, and also decision making. So kind of the general uh, kind of idea, you know, if our computers can understand uh, sight, do computer vision, understand the, the, the surrounding at levels that compete with our human level perception and make uh, decisions also, what can we do with today's technology? I'm not talking about science fiction, I'm talking about, let, let's see, what, what can we do with today's uh, technology that can help uh, humanity? And then what would be the next step? Not general AI, which is longer into the future, but what would be the, uh, the next step after that? So I, I'll talk about the uh, three areas. I'll start with the autonomous uh, driving. Autonomous driving is interesting because it's really a, a microcosmos of all what we know about artificial intelligence. On one hand, we have perception, we have uh, cameras around the car, also other sensors like radars and, and laser scanners. All this data is fed into algorithms with the purpose of perceiving the world. So the computer needs to know about uh, vehicles, road users, traffic signs, traffic lights, lanes, lane markings, anything that is relevant in order to make decisions. And then the car needs to make decisions to change lane, how to change lane, negotiate with other uh, road users. So all about perception, perception and action are really the fundamentals of AI. Normally, what, when we think about action, we think about game playing, like chess, like Go. But in the, in, in the domain of, uh, of autonomous driving, action is making decisions, negotiating with other, with other actors. So it's kind of a multi-agent uh, game. Now, the promise, if we, if we succeed of doing that, uh, first, you know, a, a significant, a dramatic reduction of, of accidents, uh, you know, the number of uh, fatalities worldwide exceeds uh, one million people a year. So if all cars would be autonomous, you know, at one, one day, then that number would be reduced uh, dramatically. Also, uh, it's a revolution of transportation. You know, if cars can drive uh, autonomously, then all what we know about mobility, about uh, traffic will change uh, fundamentally. And let me show you a slide making, uh, making this point. So on, on the left-hand side, you see the bar, the, left, the leftmost bar is, is taxi, the cost of taxi. So the y-axis is, is cost. The bar on, on the right is the cost of uh, ride-hailing, Uber, Lyft, which is about 30% lower than, than taxis. The bar on the right is what will happen to the cost per mile if we remove the driver. The driver today is about 80% of the cost. So we have another 50% reduction. The bar on the right is what happens if we do ride-sharing and not ride-pooling where you have more than one passenger per, uh, per car. So another 30 to 50% uh, reduction. Then comes uh, the, the bars in the center is the cost of uh, car ownership in different areas. So metropolitan is, would be the most dense area. It could be the center of Tel Aviv, the center of uh, San Francisco. So if you are a light user of mobility and you own a car, it really doesn't make sense. And taking an Uber Lyft is actually competitive with that. But if you are a heavy user, then it's better to own a car. But now look at the bar, look at the lines coming from the robotaxi or the ride sharing. It starts to be competitive with heavy users in metropolitan areas. But now let's look at the bar on the right, which is public transport. A ride sharing robotaxi is now competitive with bus on a cost per mile. So this is, this is a big a revolution because I'm not sure that you are aware that public transportation like buses is completely subsidized. Okay, so it, it's, it's a big uh, revolution if we can make it work. So uh, let me show you an, an, an example of, and, and well, the point I want to make is what is the biggest challenge of making this work? And then I'll go to another domain. What you're going to see here, uh, this is Shai Shalev Schwartz, my colleague is the CTO of Mobileye, also a professor at the Hebrew uh, University. Uh, we're driving here autonomous uh, car and it's powered only by cameras. We have a concept of redundancy where we have two subsystems, one just cameras and another one just radars uh, ladders. This is the subsystem using only cameras. So uh, there are 12 cameras around the car. What you see on this uh, pane, on this display is one of the cameras, the, the front camera. The interesting display is up here which integrates everything around, uh, around the car. And I want to show you a, 
a challenge and from that challenge to, uh, to make a point. So as we are moving in this uh, narrow street, we have oncoming uh, traffic, we'll reach a T-junction. Now, this T-junction, we, we need to take an unprotected uh, left, and you see that it's very congested. There are lots and lots of uh, cars. So now, the, 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 the computer needs now to negotiate with other road users in order to take a left. You need to push your way. And you see that now it's doing that. And then th th this raises a significant uh, a challenge of balancing usefulness and, uh, and safety. So let me show, show you another clip and, uh, and then I'll go to, the, go to the challenge. So this is two weeks ago, we had an investor day at uh, Intel, investors and analysts, and we took them for uh, rides in the center of uh, Jerusalem, where, all, all, where the places, the, the neighborhoods of the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. Ultra it's, uh, it's very interesting to, to drive there. So uh, uh, let's look at uh, you know, one minute of a, of a clip with the narration of one of our drivers. Okay. Detecting this vehicle, you see? So the vehicle stopped, we tried to overtake it, but we understand he's driving. It was really interesting. So this is something that really crucial for autonomous driving. Like this one, so you can see the open door. So we took some bias from it, some offsets. So we, you can see there is no lane marks. This is very difficult and very um, complicated uh, environment. See now we are slowing down because the driving in our path, making sure that this vehicle, uh, we have enough space from him and also from the pedestrian. And we have another taxi, we have pedestrian that crossing and we need to give way. So you saw how many things happened in just the last 20 seconds. Um, so. What is, the, what is the challenge? Just assume that you want to change lane. Now, if your technology is tuned to find a gap between two vehicles and find your way and then path, then design a trajectory to enter into that gap, then it's one level of, uh, of difficulty. It's very convenient because then nobody, you are not interfering with anyone's motion. There is a gap and you're simply fitting yourself into, into the gap. But if, Many of you are drivers, you know that most of the time there's no gap, right? We need, we need to create a gap. And, and this is, is creating a gap is, is a completely different level of uh, technology and of regulation. Because once you are creating a gap, it means that you need to push your way through. It's not enough that you are turning your turn signal, telling everyone else, look, I want to change lane. You're actually nudging your way through, right? You're, you're, you're pushing and pushing and pushing until the guy in the other lane in the back will yield and let you, let, you get it, let you get in. Now, this raises the possibility of risk. This raises the possibility of an accident. What happens if that other guy doesn't slow down? And, and so the, big, the biggest challenge is this catch-22. If, if we want to be able to build a proper autonomous car, it needs to drive like a human, especially if you're talking about robotaxi. Nobody's going to hire a robotaxi knowing it's going to take twice as time to reach its destination because it's too conservative. But then there's an issue of how do you balance safety and usefulness? So the whole, the whole domain of regulation, and it's not just lawyers and philosophers, it's lots of science going on into it. The whole area of regulation is the biggest challenge of how to, how to agree with society what are the rules of the game in assertive uh, driving. And this is one area that we're spending a lot, a lot of uh, time. So uh, let me go to another area where, uh, where AI is put. This is a, a a company, Orcam, I co-founded a number of years ago. Here we're looking at AI, where AI is on you. And, and the idea is, is, is what happens if we have significant processing of sight and sound on ourselves all the time? Well, we have something like this, which is a smartphone. The problem with a smartphone, it has a camera, it has a microphone, but it's in our pocket all the time. So it doesn't see and doesn't hear, right? But if you had a small device on you, that has significant computing power, can see and, and hear what can it do for you? That, so that, that was kind of the original uh, question. And then we said, okay, we, we don't know what it will do for us. So let's start identifying segments of society in which we do know what it will do for them. And the first segment is the blind and, and visually impaired. So let's, let me show you uh, a small a clip just to show Hello, you the ben. basics. Can you show Hi. us what the device does? Yeah, sure. Jonathan Vexen. Oh. 
it already recognizes you. So the first thing it does is it does face recognition. So it's so Jonathan and said its name. Let's see who else. Oh, hi, Gabe. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hi. What else can you do? So the device can read from any printed surface and recognize colors. Let me show you how it works. And read by pointing. The most coveted free agent slugger on. So, so the, the, this is the basics: ability to to read, ability to recognize faces. Now, if we add to it uh, natural language processing, you can speak to the device. So. I'm holding a document. I know what that document is. For example, it's a telephone bill. I don't want an OCR, the ability to read the entire document. I just want to know, is it addressed to me? I just want to know what's the total. So there is information I want to retrieve from, from the text. So simply ask the device about this. So let's see how this can work. Is there a name? Mr. Joe Blocks. Yeah, the name is here. Start from total. Total to you. $358.70. Read me the phone number. 1-800-267-926. Now, let's go, now let's imagine the device has also object recognition capability. So it knows about doors, furniture, glasses, and so forth, can guide you to things. So let's see an, an example of that. I see two doors on the left. Guide to the door. Close the door on the left. Close door in front of you. Door handle to the right. Got it. Two people on the right. Okay, so when you start doing combining computer vision, natural language processing, you start getting a very interesting, uh, um, very interesting you know, project that could, that could help uh, people who are blind or visually impaired. Let's look at another segment of society. Let's look at the segment of uh, hearing the, uh, disabled. So with hearing disability, there's one thing that humans are very good at. It's called the cocktail party problem. This is a, a, an, academic, uh, an academic problem that was open for the past uh, three decades. And about two years ago, there was significant progress using uh, deep networks to solve this problem. So the, the, the cocktail party problem is that we are in a place where there are many people around me and all of them are talking and we have the ability to focus only on one person. We look at the lips, the, the lips movement, we, we, we have our ways to filter in only the person that we want to filter in and we ignore everything else. Hearing aids cannot do that. So what hearing aids will do, they will amplify all the voices and simply it's a cacophony of voices and the person disconnects uh, the device. And then there is a feeling that the person with the hearing aid is kind of demented because the person is not being engaged in the discussion. What happens is not dementia, it's simply loss of, uh, loss of hearing. So now we, we can use this power of AI on, a, on the same small device, you see the device here, where the camera is, is watching the person uh, talking. So let, let's see how something like this can, uh, can work. So uh, it's the same person talking simultaneously. So, so let's see how, how it looks like. All right, so, so today we're going to talk about four things. These are the four critical things to right now. The first two. Okay, so that was the problem. So now the camera is looking at one person. You can see here uh, the bounding box of the camera and here are the, the, the center of the face. The idea is to focus on, on, on the lips. And now let's see what happens. So today I'm going to talk about four things. These are the four critical things to remember. The first is how we make numbers. Is it that? For me, it's kind of strange because... So the idea is that now if you can combine computer vision, natural language uh, processing, you can do something quite significant for people with hearing uh, disabilities. Let's look at another uh, segment where if we do, we add faces and transcription. And we use this kind of technology to do uh, diarization where multiple people are talking and you want to transcribe only, only one person. This is another device which is focused on faces and, uh, and, and transcription. Um, let, me, let me show you this diarization idea. Hello, Hi. I'm Leah, and I'm, I'm from New York, but living in Jerusalem, working at Orvio. So the idea is when, when, when you can transcribe the only the person that, that, we are, that we're looking at. At the same time okay. as I am. 
And the idea of a transcription are, are in hospital environments. You know, physicians, uh, staff uh, members, uh, they need to write a lot of uh, reports. 40% of their time is in front of a computer. But you can save all of that if you have a device that will tr transcribe your interactions with, uh, with patients, create the report, and then use that to report in order to find uh, uh, codes, use some natural language understanding to find codes and prepare the report automatically. So the idea of recognizing people and transcribing has a very interesting uh, use case. The last thing, um, I want to go to something a bit more futuristic. So what, what I've shown so far, it's existing technology. It's the, uh, the AI technology, the narrow AI technology that, that we all uh, learn. We see YouTube clips on it, we take uh, courses, how it can be harnessed for autonomous driving and be harnessed to uh, help people who are visually impaired and hearing impaired. Uh, let, let's look at a domain of uh, natural language and understanding. So today there, there's no technology that will read a book, say Game of Thrones, War and Peace, and be able to answer probing text, uh, questions on the, entire, on the entire book. There are lots of uh, successes in the past two years in natural language understanding, but this particular task that I mentioned is still science fiction to uh, the technology of natural language understanding. But there is a lot of interesting progress uh, going on. And uh, Ben mentioned uh, GPT-2, he mentioned uh, BERT, uh, all of those um, you know, networks are, are showing a, a great, uh, great promise. So the idea is, let's look at, uh, at okay, I'll, I'll, skip, I'll, I'll skip this. Let's look at the following problem. Just like calculators have alleviated the need for us to do calculations, I don't know how many of you know how to take a square root or how many uh, scientists know how to solve a differential equation. Uh, there's no need to do it because computers can do it very efficiently. So, so we shifted our creativity to understanding, to figuring out what equation to solve and not how to solve uh, the equation. Right? Now the same thing, I believe, in the near future, so near could be five years, will happen to writing. You don't need to write. All you need to express is, are, are, are your ideas. Once you express the ideas, the computer will be able to fill in everything else and, and write it according to a certain style and so forth. Now, this is not science fiction. I believe it will happen in the next few years. GPT-2 is, is kind of the first step where you start with a piece of text, a sentence, and then the machine tries to complete everything else, but it, it wanders off very, very quickly. Here's another idea from a company, AI21, uh, where it starts with a starting sentence and an ending sentence, and then the computer fills in the rest. So if you look at GPT-2, where the, the sentence here is, uh, you know, let's uh, discuss for a second woman, and then, you know, starts completing sex and so forth. Uh, but if we say the end sentence is why empowering girls is so important, then the text being generated starts to make more, more sense. Now, th th this is a, a very, very, it's a toy idea of, of ending with a, uh, with a sentence, but once we, we put this on, on the web and people started uh, using this, you see all sorts of very interesting uh, uh, comments made by, uh, made by people, right? You know, filled in the middle, I don't think I could have done better myself. Of course, this is a, an exaggeration. It will also uh, wonder, just like GPT-2, wonder less, but also wonder. But this shows the promise. The promise is that this is only a starting point. One can figure out how to express ideas. It's not going to be a starting sentence and an ending sentence, it's much more complicated than that. But then let the machine write everything else. And, and, and that will create a revolution in the area of, uh, of writing. So I believe that this is kind of the, the, the next small step, the next baby step from narrow AI to, uh, to general AI. Okay, thank you.